Julian Siciliano is doing a presentation in about strato pianos today. She says, I am here to introduce a strato piano or a piano with narrow keys and explain why it is absolutely necessary to ensure gender and racial equality for all pianists. Since 1880, the standard size of the piano keyboard with a six and a half inch octave has been unchanged. This keyboard was built for the major piano virtuosi of the time, who were mostly white European males. Prior to 1880, you could order a keyboard in any size and most were smaller since they would be used by mostly female amateurs inside their homes. Julie will share a great deal of information and statistics on hand sizes across gender and race and include reasons a strato piano keyboard can be a valuable teaching tool as well. You will see why strato pianos are not only necessary but urgently needed if we truly care about equality. Thank you so much, Julia, for sharing this information with us. Thank you, Kamta, for allowing me to share this really important information and um, Yumi for inviting me to give this exact presentation. So um, my name is Julia Siciliano. I'm a concert pianist with small hands. I can reach a knife, and with a fair bit of stretching, I can reach a knife. Um, I, I always like to ask, uh, what are the hand spans in this crowd? Anybody willing to to offer what their reach is? Nine, ten, ninth, barely a ninth, ninth. Would we say, hold out your hand if you can reach a tenth. Okay, there's a fair number, not a majority, but there are a lot of women in the room too, so I'm gonna get to that point. Um, but in any case, I'm here to discuss strato pianos with you today. Let's see if this works. So who has heard of a strato piano? Good, in the room maybe about, I don't almost know, half. But I don't know about strato piano, but we've heard about this. Or, yes, or um, the other thing you may have heard is an ergonomically scaled piano keyboard, or ESPK. Yeah, so we have, we've had people who've heard of both of those. Um, in case you don't know what this is, the best way I can explain it is to look at our current standard keyboard, which is right here. We have an octave is a six and a half inch range on a standard keyboard. A strato keyboard is going to have a smaller measurement for an octave. Um, for those of you physically in here with me today, I have brought a prototype of a six inch octave strato keyboard. You're welcome to come try it out and see how it feels in your hand at any point. Also for fun, I've brought a prototype of a 7.6 inch octave. Um, this is more for those who do have a normal hand span to feel empathy for those of us who don't. <laughs> Try playing an octave on the 7.6 inch and then understand how we of smaller hands feel all the time. So um, there's this this, the DS Standard Foundation, which is named after its creators, Christopher Donison and David Steinbuehler. And they're making right now three distinct keyboard sizes. They're making a six inch octave, which I have a prototype here. They're making a five and a half inch octave and newly a 5.1 inch octave. Would it be a good idea to pass them around? Sure, yeah. They're there are two octaves, but they're held together by magnets, so just be careful. Or you can pass them separately. <laughs> <laughs> I have small hands. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay.
that the standard keyboard has only been standard for a little over 100 years. Prior to the 20th century, keyboards were made to order and not made in factories like they are now. Most pianists were sold to, uh, most pianos were sold to amateur pianists who were majority female. Women have smaller hands than men. Therefore, many keyboards were made on a smaller scale. And as was already mentioned, um, the reason these weren't made standard is because the major concert virtuosi were white males. Um, so we have yet another reason to blame Franz Liszt for our current problems. <laughs> you know he's the one who, who made us memorize music too, right? So thank you, Liszt. <laughs> Luckily, women are no longer rele relegated to the home and are equally encouraged to become concert pianists. The problem that women face today, and any pianist with smaller hands, is that a large keyboard can cause injury, um, or it can prevent learning a, a wide swath of repertoire, like especially this virtuosic repertoire from the Romantic era and beyond. Um, I personally have struggled with physical issues and had to see a physical therapist due to, in my case, too much Brahms. Um, sad that I, I tried to do a Brahms project and um, by the end of the year it was, um, I had to see a physical therapist. And um, I heard many other women being told by their doctors they had to quit piano entirely because they were causing permanent damage. Um, some who just simply decided to not pursue a performing career because they would never be able to play the repertoire at a competitive enough level. Lest we start sounding like a, a women's issues discussion, I want to bring up the famous pianist Joseph Hoffman. Um, some of you may know the story that Rachmaninoff dedicated his third piano concerto to Hoffman, and Hoffman refused to learn it. Why? Probably because he had small hands. This picture on the left here is of Hoffman's hand span, and you can see it is, it is barely, just barely a tenth. The picture on the right is Rachmaninoff, who well known could reach a thirteenth. Um, so, uh, but despite that, due to his fame, you know, Hoffman actually uh, requested and was granted this request by Steinway to have a Strato keyboard made for him. Now, it wasn't a six inch, it was um, 6.3 inch, which doesn't seem that much difference until, again, you see, he can, he can just barely reach a tenth. You can imagine that just a little, Point two extra helped him play all of the repertoire that um, any virtuoso is basically required to be playing. You will find this history on the Steinway website. What you won't find is Steinway offering to do this again anytime soon. <laughs> In case you're skeptical that key size makes any difference, I would like to share with you some specific statistics. Let's talk about competitions. Though winning a competition is not the only path to success, it is a justifiable indicator. In the last century, piano competition winners and major concert pianists have all been overwhelmingly male. We can compare piano competition results with string competition results and find no such discrepancy in the strings. This is because string players can choose the size of their instruments. Um, as a quick side note, I used to accompany Suzuki strings, and I would love it. I would love seeing these, these beginners come in with these little pint-sized cellos, and then you know the next year they'd advance into you know three-quarter size, and then you know seven-eighth size, and then finally you know they'd be taller than me, 
and they have oboe size. And um, I kind of have a dream that we can do that with pianos too. Uh, imagine how much easier it will be to teach little ones without having to stretch and distort their hand from the beginning just to play a triad, for instance. Um, my cousin, another personal note, my cousin is a violist and she was having a lot of wrist and arm pain and it was causing her to have to cancel gigs. Um, and finally what she did is she replaced her viola for one that has a smaller size. No more problems there. Why don't we have this option as pianists? Um, first, this chart that I'm showing you here, it shows female versus male hand spans. The red is female, the uh, blue is male. But what I like about this particular chart is it also has a specific label for pianists who have international acclaim. Uh, for reference, this chart is based on research by Rhonda Boyle, Robin Boyle, and Erica Booker called Pianist Handspans, Gender and Ethnic Differences and Implications for Piano Playing. As you look at the chart, I want to direct your attention to a few details. I've highlighted where an octave is, that's your first yellow highlight marker. The second one is a ninth, the third a tenth, and the fourth an eleventh. As you can see, males far outnumber females on the larger range of the spectrum. Uh, furthermore, if you see the arrows, those are pointed towards these um, outlined black circles that are, they're outlining individual pianists who have reached international acclaim. Again, it's interesting to note that on this entire chart, only two females were given this designation. There are several more males. And the females um, both had hand spans that could reach beyond a tenth. If you're curious about the, um, the racial differences in this study, they are between Caucasian and Asian hands. Um, as you can imagine, Asian men have smaller hands than Caucasian men, but they have larger hands than Caucasian women. Um, Asian women came out with generally the smallest hands. When we think about our largest demographic of pianists today being Asians, it's again a wonder why strato pianos are not more widely known or manufactured. The next table I'm sharing takes a look at all the major piano competitions in the world and gender differences among all the, winter, all, all the winners, even more specifically the first prize winners. Just quickly glancing at the percentages of women winning, I thought I would point out that there has never been a female first prize winner in the Rubenstein competition, and only one female first prize winner in the entire history of the Tchaikovsky piano competition. You will see that females do outnumber men in two of these, and that is the Bach and the Mozart competitions. This will come as no surprise since this repertoire requires smaller reaches. So um, this chart was completed in 2022 and I thought I would go and do my own personal research and see if there's been any change since then. Guess what? Nope. Um, the, the most recent Tchaikovsky piano competition, there were eight winners, six of which were male and they all received the top four of those prizes. The, or sorry, the top six. The, the bottom two of those eight prizes went to the women who did make the finals. Um, I also did a, a quick scan of who won in the other instrumental categories of the Tchaikovsky competition. Women won first prize in every single category with the exception of brass. Another competition update since 2022 is our famed Rubenstein competition, and guess what? Still no female first prizes. The next two chart charts I'm showing you come from the MTNA competitions, um, ranging from 1963. 
The first chart shows string, uh, actually I, I did this backwards. The second, the chart on the right shows string uh, competition winners and the chart on the left shows piano competition winners. Uh, and there are three age groups. We have 11 to 14, 15 to 18, and 19 to 26. Blue represents males, red represents females. As you can see, females outnumber males in all of these age groups in the string category. The piano category is a little different. The women, the, the girls outnumber the boys in the 11 through 14 age group. They kind of even out in that 15 to 18 year old range. But once they get to the adult range, the 19 to 26 category, men again outnumber women. And this time by more than double. So it's not difficult to see that women have a harder time of achieving success in an elite realm of piano playing. So what can be done about this? As I mentioned before, the DS Foundation has been making ESPKs since 1970. They currently have their three keyboard sizes, six inches octaves, five and a half inch, and 5.1 inch. Um, I love the idea of having a children's size piano. As I mentioned before, we can start training them with proper um, technique without having to, you know, eliminate tension as their hand gets big, bigger and they're more likely able to fit the standard piano. The DS Foundation has even begun the initiative of loaning strato pianos to universities which is how I tried one for the first time. After meeting a lovely small-handed pianist at NCKP, Jeren Suushain, I learned that the University of Michigan was temporarily housing two DS keyboards in their practice rooms. It did not take me long to make a trip to Ann Arbor, and as soon as I did it, my world was changed forever. By the way, I owe a lot of credit to Jaren as I used her DMA dissertation as a reference for many of my points today. There is one literal reference I'd like to take from her, and that is a video she took of pianists' hands playing the same passage. They were playing this crazy opening lick of the Chopin second piano sonata. Now I oh, space cut, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so what you're looking at is the top hand, it's a large hand, the bottom one is a small one. In the first video, they're playing the same standard size keyboard. In the second, the large hand, sorry. In the second, the large hand is still playing the standard keyboard and the small hand is now playing a stretto keyboard. Um, you learn two things from this video. One, you see how much less reaching the small hand is doing in the second video than it has to do in the first. Um, but you also see in the second video that the small hand is still much more mobile than the large hand. And this is because small-handed pianists have had to learn how to use our hands in a healthy way, simply in order to get through the repertoire. Um, in fact, our very own Campton member, Dr. Michael Finley, a well-known local injury prevention teacher here in Chicago, advised, I've heard him advise his students that, um, the students with large hands, to think like they have small hands in order to be freer in the wrist and not stretch so much. So, small-handed pianists, let's take this as a win. <laughs> But perhaps the most sensational news I have for all of you today, and something I'm hoping someone watching this right now might be able to take action on, there is currently a DS Foundation six inch keyboard ready to be loaned to the first university that is able to accept it. This particular keyboard was designed to fit in either a Yamaha C6 or C7. So, if you are affiliated with the university, you have one of these pianos, and you would love to be the very first institution in Chicago to have a stretto keyboard, 
please let me know as soon as possible and I can put you in touch with the DS Foundation. This is a free 12 month loan. Another bit of good news is all the support Stretto Pianos are getting around the world. In fact, the woman responsible for coining the term Stretto, Hannah Ryman, began the International Stretto Piano Festival four years ago. It started during the pandemic with performers uploading videos online, and it has turned into, this year, 16 live concerts around the world. I was lucky enough to participate in one of them just a couple weeks ago at Symphony Space in New York City. And up here is a video of my performance. It is a actually a 5.9 inch strato piano that um, Hannah Ryman, who was in very close contact with the Steinway guys in the, the mid 1990s, she got she got Stein, she got a strato piano to be put in her to be retrofitted in her Steinway piano. So it's actually an incredible instrument. Um, and the reason I'm putting this video up here, well, there's a couple of reasons. First, um, I want you to hear that a smaller keyboard does not have a smaller sound. And although not a perfect adjustment, um, I had only two hours to warm up the previous day on this instrument. Um, I'm still pretty impressed by how many right notes I was able to get <laughs> even after <laughs> short practice. <laughs> so maybe just, um, oh, and I wonder if I can jump ahead. I can't really do that on this. Because it's, it's in a different part of the page. Are you able to find that Sorry guys, technical difficulties. Well, maybe at the end I can get the sound to work on this. I don't wanna waste too much time with this. So I'll come back to that. Um, apart from Hannah's support, we have one of Chicago's and the world's most prominent musical voices ever to chime in, Daniel Barenboim himself. Um, Barenboim has small hands. He, um, we, if we know much about his piano playing, we can see that reflected in the repertoire that he chooses to perform or has chosen throughout his life. Um, Bach, Mozart, Schubert, Beethoven. Um, it's interesting because when you think of his conducting repertoire, there's no limit. He does all the great, vast, romantic, contemporary works. Why would he limit himself on the piano? maybe due to the size of his hands. Um, I actually know uh, personally that he does have a strato keyboard that was made for him. I saw him perform a complete Beethoven sonata recital on it in Dresden. It was beautiful. So he has been performed of the, he has been informed of the international strato piano concerts and he lends his support to our mission. Now, I'd like to share with you my personal ultimate goal. I would love for Stretto Pianos to be available in every concert hall in the world. This could take the form of a piano built from scratch with a Stretto keyboard or a keyboard, a keyboard and action stack built to fit in an existing piano frame. That's what you're looking at here. Like the one in this picture, one can easily swap a keyboard and action stack in under 15 minutes, giving the pianist a choice of which size keyboard they prefer to perform on. Can you imagine if all international piano competitions had this option? Can you imagine if all concert halls did? I think we'd be hearing a lot more pianists we're simply not hearing right now. Um, so there are companies that are making these keyboard and action stacks from anywhere from 11 to, to $16,000 depending on the materials used. This is much cheaper, say, than buying a brand new piano. 
In order to reach this goal of mine, more people have to know these pianos exist. If you are so moved, please help me share this information with your colleagues, students, and all of your music-loving friends. Um, I would like to leave you with some resources in case you'd like to learn more on your own. The first is the PASC website. Um, this stands for Pianists for Alternatively Sized Keyboards. You can find all the information I shared and much, much more, including the latest news on the Stratto keyboard front. The second is the Stratto Piano Concerts website. Here you can learn about the history and mission of the Stratto Piano Concerts. You can watch footage from previous editions and you can donate to the festival. Thank you all so much for tuning in, for your interest, for your curiosity in this subject. I hope one day we can have a similar talk again right here at Pianoforte with the Stratto Piano on stage. <laughs> I don't even know if I left time for questions. So. Let's see if I can get the video to work. And then, sorry, how do I find the actual page that had it in front of me so I can skip to it later? Could you put the website in the, in the chat? Mm -hmm. I couldn't get it. Yeah. Does somebody know? So is the sound working on it? My own personal experience suggests two hours isn't quite enough. Um, although I did manage to perform the complete Brahms Opus 119 on this instrument on just two hours practice. Um, Jaren uh, Sushahin, who, the University of Michigan doctoral graduate, she did her dissertation and she, she actually researched this exact thing. I believe her research came up with any pianist of any hand size can adapt to any of these um, different levels of stretto keyboard in five days. 100% adept. And I think she said um, a minimum of an hour a day or five hours a week is what she was um, recommending. So it is possible, um, again, for any size hand. I imagine with a smaller hand it would take you less long than someone with a larger hand. Real quick, let me see if I can get the sound. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question.
So you can hear it's not a tiny instrument despite the size of the keys. Yeah. Actually, my question concerns that you mentioned that it, the small keys don't mean a small sound. Did you actually find the opposite, that it was easier to create more sound because, uh, because you had access to more of your power? Yeah, the question was, did you find that, in fact, it was easier as a small-handed pianist to create big sound having smaller keys? Yeah, absolutely. Especially because, uh, especially in that repertoire, which is all chords, that was the Rhapsody, the last movement of Brahms Opus 119. I just could use more of my uh, my body properly when my hands weren't outstretched. So it was easier to get a big, beautiful sound. Thanks for that question. Um, I just want to bring up something to help answer the previous question. Um, I did my um, my master's degree on a 7-8 side keyboard, um, and I was part of the research for this project. And so um, I practiced my romantic pieces, my uh, Rachmaninoff and Chopin, every day on a 7 8 keyboard, which I guess is probably what, five and a half inch. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And then um, I practiced my Bach and my Mozart on a regular keyboard. No problem at all. Um, they were kind of, they gave me space for the research to kind of time me on how long it took me to feel comfortable. Um, we were talking earlier, octaves were the hardest, but um, I practiced for a whole year on um, these, the, this repertoire on the 7 8 keyboard, and then about a week before the performance, I started, I would warm up on the 7 8 and then play on the regular, and um, it was fine. Like a week ahead of time when I just started transferring my repertoire to the regular piano, um, there was no problem at all. My brain just picked it up. It was familiar. Um, it's just like when you're running up some stairs and you go, go to another building and the stairs are just a little bit wider. It's not that you can't run up the stairs. You just click into that and then, and you're fine. Um, so I practiced that entire year without any tension in my body. So when I was able to play on stage and I was using a regular size keyboard, I didn't have any of that built-in tension. You know, when you're getting to the hard part and like you can feel it in your body, I didn't have any of that because I'd never practiced that into the pieces. Mm -hmm. So um, what she's saying is that they can be gone, you can go back and forth between the two of them, that it's not a lifetime commitment to a certain size of keyboard. Thanks so much. Um, I am only supposed to have a half an hour and we do have a really wonderful presentation um, coming up next. Do you mind if I reserve questions for after her presentation? Yeah, okay. thanks guys. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Julia. This was wonderful and so interesting and I know Everybody has lots of questions. Hopefully we'll all go out to lunch afterwards and we can discuss all these things. But now we have our very own Regina Serkin to talk about myths and uh, ideas about the Russian school of music. I'm not going to read her whole bio. Uh, Just myself because it's part of it. Okay, <laughs> Regina will, will yeah, tell her own story. story, so we look forward to hearing this about the Russian School of Music. Thank you. So, um, first a few words um, about myself. Uh, I was born, grew up, and got all my education in former Soviet Union, now it's uh, Belarus. Uh, I got my degree from Minsk State Conservatory in, oh, oh, sorry, in um, piano performance, piano, piano pedagogy. Move the mic closer. Yeah, no, you're like two inches from your mouth. Closer. Closer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And uh, chamber music accompaniment oh, standard stuff. Okay, in, 19, in December of 1990, I uh, immigrated to US, arrived in Chicago, and um, 
I was not prepared at all to continue with my career. Don't forget it was a pre-internet time. <laughs> so I spent hours and hours uh, in the library. At that time it was uh, on Michigan where the cultural center is. Okay, so I spent hours reading uh, dictionaries, uh, learning their terminology. Well, I knew it's not what I mean, but I received, but the rest was not very clear to me. I mean, it's, it's a long story. Uh, so, uh, and then um, I read a lot of books uh, and articles, magazines, music magazines, and then I would walk another couple blocks to the Carl Fisher music store and look through the books and uh, meta books, and, you know. Um, and I, I, I like to study, I'm still learning uh, and reading <laughs> what I can find interesting to me. Um, and very often while reading these articles or listening to some presenters, I got this, that is Russian method, this is Russian method, this is famous Russian method, but uh, I never heard about it. <laughs> I never heard of result of Russian method. My mother was a piano teacher, so I was kind of inside of it, never heard. And then I uh, read a bit more and tried to analyze. Um, and now I'm going to tell you the big secret that Russian method, piano method, does not exist. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, you cannot really, uh, I don't know, organize different methods uh, according to geography. So uh, a few names you probably heard. Uh, the first uh, music conservatory uh, was uh, established, uh, opened in St. Petersburg in 1862. The founder of it is Anton Rubinstein, we call it, or Anton Rubinstein. Uh, yeah. um, so, he, uh, he was a brilliant uh, pianist, virtuoso, and a composer. He wrote a lot of orchestra works, piano concertos, opera, but for some reasons his music doesn't sound very often. Um, he, he's still remembered uh, for his uh, series of historic concerts. His repertoire included all keyboard works which were published, which you could find, up until his days. And he performed a lot in Europe, all over Europe. Uh, he was uh, a friend with Terence Liszt, or Mendelssohn, and Mayer Bear, and uh, many other musicians. Of the, uh, he was, uh, I would say, a close friend with Lyshetinsky. Um, and, um, yeah, uh, Rubinstein was invited to teach a uh, sister-in-law of Russian Tsar, and sometimes when he went on a tour, he asked Lyshetinsky, for example, to um, uh, substitute him. But um, Lyshetinsky was not a very patient person. <laughs> One of the princes, uh, she, she played out of rhythm, and he got so aggravated. One day he grabbed the music and threw it away. And, Hallway. So that was his last day in Winter Palace. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, now we have we know about uh, Lushitsky. He was married a few times. All his wives were his students, and uh, one of them, uh, um, Anna Yesipova, uh, she was teaching um, at the Petersburg Conservatory, and she was a teacher of Prokofiev. So you can actually see the line from, I don't know, Beethoven, Czerny, Liszt, uh, Lyshetinsky, Yesipova, Prokofiev, okay, and, and many others. Uh, 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 Rubinstein had only one, uh, Rubinstein, sorry, he had only one student, Joseph Hoffman, who became American pianist, uh, which you just mentioned his name. So. Uh, it's, it's very <laughs> intertwined, you know. You cannot say there is a Russian method or German method or French or Italian or American or African, you know, mm -hmm. it don't exist. But of course, there are some details uh, in, in typical for each country probably do exist. So um, I think that we, 
magic teachers. But we have to study as many methods as we can. And since we have, you know, private lessons, individual students, each one deserves like custom-made method according to his needs, uh, interests, and so on. So if you find any tips helpful, I'll be happy. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so what actually is really different, I think, from Russian schools, uh, uh, Russian schools from others, is the very rigid, I would say, system, strict, uh, and um, you know, until nowadays, uh, they try to fit. Of course, there are a lot of new ideas, but in so Russia is a big country, so many provincial <laughs> besides capital, <laughs> uh, they still keep the same uh, curriculum traditions. And it's not only in Russia, but the former Soviet republics. I just recently talked to a person from Georgia and from Kazakhstan, just my colleagues. Uh, yeah, they, they try to do to keep it up the same way. Um, so um, the system was um, developed, created by Dunesin's family. You see, uh, you know but uh, it's a. Um, a big family of seven kids. The mother was a professional pianist. She studied in Germany and she taught all her kids uh, piano. Uh, so there were five girls and two boys. Six of these kids became professional musicians. <laughs> okay. And um, they lived in south of, of uh, Russia. And when the father passed away uh, to make their living, they decided to move to Moscow. Uh, uh, so they started from they, I said, because uh, Elena, I think she's the, the oldest sister, and there are three more. They, they together, they opened first the music studio, and then uh, they bought a building for bigger school. Um, by the way, Elena studied in uh, Petersburg Conservatory uh, with Firucha Buzoni, talking about the Russian mm -hmm. method. It's really very wide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, so, her school, uh, their school, uh, was there, became very quickly very popular because it was very different than other schools uh, open at that time in, in Moscow, I guess. Uh, they, from the very beginning, they paid a lot of attention to the repertoire and to the study of theory, so hedge, ensembles, and so on. So it was uh, different. and. What they started uh, was uh, kind of organized and became a, a strict curriculum to any music school in Russia. Um, so the, first of all, there are three uh, levels. Music school for everyone who passes the test, college, uh, four years. Uh, the school usually seven, eight years. Uh, the college, four years, and the graduates from college can teach at school, and then five years of conservatory. So, I, I have nine years of professional study. Uh, that is almost standard. <laughs> um, I want to focus mostly on, on the school uh, schools because that's what we deal with mostly students who uh, take piano, not professionals, but for their own enjoyment. Okay, so I mentioned that uh, the schools were open for everyone who passed the test. So the test for six, seven year olds was pretty simple. You sing a song or uh, cite a poem, clap the rhythm, uh, repeat the tune. I wasn't accepted. I couldn't sing. I still cannot. <laughs> and so they crossed out my name, uh, but then they realized my mom was working there, so they accepted me. <laughs> 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 it was a big competition. Right? They couldn't take everyone, yeah? If I tell you that they, it was almost for free, then you understand. It's a big deal, really. Uh, not anymore. <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. This part has changed completely. Uh, so, uh, from the first year, every student um, had twice a week 45 minute uh, lesson, um, whatever instrument it is, and an hour of solfeggio and theory. Uh, from grade four, I believe, four or five, they added on uh, uh, music literature, ensembles, all the 
theater uh, students had to sing in a choir. The other instrumentalists, they had to take piano, uh, not like on the same scale, but like 30 minutes a week lessons, and they had to play in different uh, bands, orchestras, and so on. Uh, usually after four or five years, the, the teachers and the parents, the families decide whether the student will continue uh, studying piano, just, just being an, an amateur, or they would start preparing for the, uh, for the professional studies at the college and then my conservatory. Um, at the beginning of every school year, the teacher had to write down the program, the, the list of their compositions for the whole year for the students, and then the, the head of the department would check. <laughs> So it's appropriate to the level, and we had special programs printed, so you can choose the pieces from there. Uh, of course, you can take like one or two pieces below the grade or above, but if you go too fast, too high, it was not uh, encouraged. It was very, very <laughs> cautiously about that. Um, you, usually, yeah, I think the students have to play 12 pieces per school year, okay? Um, and uh, three times a year there was a uh, recital, um, but not like the, with cookies afterwards, but it, it was like an exam. <laughs> the, the parents were not allowed, the kids were in the, in the hall, uh, everyone played, so usually two, three pieces, uh, and then the kids leave the room and uh, the whole uh, uh, faculty panel. They would discuss every performance and uh, grade. Um, and there were a couple uh, technical exams. I, I don't remember one or twice per year. I think it varies. So, <laughs> very strict. Um, uh, the, the system itself. But um, I think what else is uh, different, um, the work on the technique, and uh, and repertoire, how I will try to explain. So uh, you know, at the beginning, uh, well, actually, similar to Suzuki method, uh, according to old Russian traditions, the students uh, don't start from just reading music and playing like that. But uh, the idea is that if the child can sing a tune, he should be able to play by ear with the teacher's help. And then these little tunes we can use as an exercise. But the exercises, of course, that's the core from the very beginning. Uh, and um, now, unlike Suzuki, we never start with staccato, like this prima butter sandwich that mm -hmm. was considered very wrong. Uh, okay, we usually start from playing non legata. This is something which we don't read or hear a, a lot about, but I think it's the, the main thing. Um, for example, you mentioned that uh, a lot of pianists have injuries, like old piano teachers school, they think that there was something at the beginning of this where the students didn't learn how to relax his arm. Okay, and it starts from, from simple concept like that.
fantasy in D minor by Mozart, and I realized that this is the best example of what I just said. Uh, I mean, to put the hammer and try to find it. should be one of the first acquisitions of a student who would become a fine pianist. It is impossible to conceive of fine playing that is not marked by clean, fluent, distinct, elastic technique. The technical ability of the performer should be of such a nature that it can be applied immediately to all the artistic demands of the composition to be interpreted. Well, there are a lot of interesting things. So uh, another, uh, it may be interesting to hear something of the uh, general plan followed in the uh, imperial music schools of Russia. But that, it's, it's a long, I, I, you know, I prepared this uh, presentation for an hour, so I'm trying to <laughs> come back. Okay, so um, what he is talking about um, is that um, so the, in the Russian schools, uh, uh, okay, hold on. The, the course in, is nine years in duration. During the first five years, the student gets most of his technical instruction from a book of studies by him. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, and then, uh, what else? Uh, 
uh, also interesting uh, words, uh, 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 Joseph Levine, you know, the resin and Joseph Levine, the teachers who prepared the rock of Paris. Uh, so he said, uh, um, I have been amazed to find pupils coming from America who have been able to play a few pieces very well but who wonder why they find it difficult to extend their musical sphere when the whole tr uh, trouble lies in, in an almost total absence of regular daily technical work, systematically pursued through several years. And, um, the practice of scales and arpeggios need never be mechanical or uninteresting. This depends upon the attitude of mind in which the teacher places the pupil. In fact, the teacher is largely responsible if the pupil finds scale practice dry or tiresome. It is because the pupil has not been given enough to think about in scale playing, not enough to look out for in nuance, evenness, touch, rhythm, etc. So, uh, scales, <laughs> I'm not going to play for the next step, uh, chords. Uh, here I notice uh, it's not very often, even though it's a requirement for the aim, but uh, many books they don't even suggest to play chords or uh, so on. Um, that was the main thing, uh, the, the, the next step after the scales is the chords. And actually, I, I always tell my students it's the same like when we play rainbows. But it is more, so you dive in, you roll out the wrist, you reshape your hand, then you bend the next one, okay? Uh, um, what else uh, is very often missed is the broken chords. Uh, we, don't, we don't do three sound chords, we did not do, I don't know, we did four. And that's where the, word, the wrist works, because so the, this, no matter whether you start with the first or the fifth finger, the first movement is directly down and then like, gradually up, like rolling. So it's like the... And the backwards, the same movement, starting from five, okay? That is the breathing for the <laughs> arms and it's important. Also. Only then the arpeggio are introduced. Oh, what does is kind of tricky. I don't know the special name of this. It's like skipping. It's broken chord skipping notes, right? I, I don't know if there's a special name for that. But you can see it a lot in any music. <laughs> um, yeah, and so uh, I recently read about this, the, what uh, Joseph Levine said. But yeah, I remember, let's say, especially when you prepare your scales for the technique exam, and you remember all your sharps and all the finger, but if you play like okay, <laughs> so because you have you can teach at least a regular crescendo and diminuendo down using this stuff, right? Or arpeggio like this, right? That's that's. But arpeggio is the hardest because of this. You know, you have to practice a lot of turning around the thumb, right? Not pulling, bringing it down, and so on. So uh, I'm sure it's, it's not something completely new, but might be some tips <laughs> you notice. Um, so, um, of course, at the beginning level, yeah, there's one more thing I wanted to say. Um, so, um, in in Russian music schools, uh, the beginning book uh, until now becomes like almost a Bible. It's it's called uh, the School of Playing Piano, practically. Okay, uh, the editor was Nikolaev, and he was a student of Gnesina. Uh, this book is um, uh, published in the States too. Uh, it's designed for the first couple years of the studying piano. And beginning is very simple. Um, it starts even with one hand, one step, one hand. Folk tunes, simple tunes. 
what's the difference? Uh, there's never special, this is C major position or G major or any of these. Different pieces of songs written in different keys and, and the kids from the beginning get used to, uh, to pay attention to the key signature and, and remember it and whatever, <laughs> okay. And, um, and of course, uh, any, any of the songs could be used like, like an exercise, right? Every new song uh, teaches some new, new skills at the beginning level, it's, it's understandable. Um, and um, so uh, I, will, um, I will read the, uh, a few sentences from the introduction he uh, write, uh, wrote down in this book to the teacher. So the main purpose of this publication is a, a, a quality improvement of an aspiring pianist repertoire. It's a well-known fact that a young musician's first practical touch of their art of music plays an enormously important role in the formation of a young pianist's musical taste and his attitude towards a musical art in general. Very often, his first stage being the most difficult and important in music education determines the whole future success of a child in music. Uh, this first stage also determines whether a child will be a professional musician and a great lover of music, or he will remain indifferent to it for good. That depends on both a teacher's skill and student's degree of talent. However, no effort can lead to the desired result without a complete and an aesthetically high quality of musical material for practical study. Okay, so, um, uh, in this book, uh, the second half uh, includes standard repertoire with famous minuets, little sonatinas by Clementi, and a lot of etudes as well. So uh, the, um, the etudes are not played instead of scales or after the scales, it's just part of technical work. Uh, and Cherny, of course, uh, it's in this order, Czerny Gellner, then uh, the School of Velocity, Opus 299, and then Opus 740, and then Clementi, Gradus of Parnassum, uh, like that. That's standard, and then every student has to you know, cry over some of them, okay? <laughs> 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 yeah. um, now, uh, briefly, what, what else? Um, yeah. There's one more thing, <laughs> I forgot. Uh, so uh, for the beginners, uh, there are very interesting little etudes by Gnesina. Uh, I, I have this. Yeah, again, you can find it online. They're very good, uh, not too difficult. The kids like the music is light, and that's uh, the, the, all the main principle of, you know, the technique. The, the, to feel free, not to feel tied to the one position, but move over the keyboard freely. Um, now, I also want to talk uh, a little bit about pedaling. It's not exactly the technique, uh, if we talk about, uh, it, it's not exactly the technical part, but if we talk about technique as a narrow word, just fast fingers, but you can look at the word technique as the sound producing. And that's where the pedal um, is very important. But before that, I, I remember, uh, that's what Vladimir Korovitz said. That instrument is uh, uh, capable of sounds which are loud or soft. But in between, there are many, many degrees of sounds which may be played. To be able to produce many varieties of sound, now then it is what I call technique. And that is what I try to do. I don't adhere to any methods because I simply don't believe in them. <laughs> I think each pianist must ultimately carve his own way, technically and stylistically. I think it's a good word to, to remember. <laughs> so back to uh, the pedal. The rule number one, it never substitutes legato. Okay, you use your fingers and try to do, we were, it, it was a must to learn without the pedal anything. 
Okay, and then uh, of course when you add on the pedal, it, it makes so much easier. Okay, but uh, you simply have to remember that the pedal is uh, uh, plays a lot of different roles. Okay, and connecting the sounds is just one of them. So I usually I um, start also with the exercise, simple exercise. I use the one finger and bass. Mm -hmm part of the piano, and I will try to play chromatic scale, connecting the notes, we got it. We press the key, we press the pedal, let go the key, the sound is done. We have a very next key, and then the pedal goes up and down immediately. And like that, with touching around that <laughs> Okay, so, uh, and I explained that in the low register, it's easier to hear a really messy sound. <laughs> okay, but I also want to introduce, um, the book uh, of uh, pedal preludes by also Russian composer Samuel Maikapar. Uh, well, first of all, he wrote a lot of beautiful music for, for kids, for students. Um, and in this uh, book, I mean, each uh, okay. each uh, prelude uh, gives different types of, of uh, uh, pedaling. For example, rhythmic pedal like this. Okay, rhythmic, but then um, delay pedal, for example, what is it here? All right. Um, I personally like to use, uh, well, this is, this is all good, good music and, and good repertoire, but I, I, I use one piece of music which is the best exercise for pedal, even though it was not uh, composed for that. And this is the uh, signal from Bajikovsky from, where is it? From, uh, okay, uh, the album for, for the young. And it, it just works really well. So.